Good morning, everyone. Okay, we're just about ready to begin our plenary session. Welcome to everyone. Hey, good morning and welcome again to the 65th meeting of the Literacy Research Association. I hope everyone is having a wonderful conference so far. I'm Becky Rogers and I am the co-chair with Pat and CISO for the 2015 program. I want to thank you all for attending the conference here in Carlsbad. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few announcements in today's brief agenda. Uh, make sure a couple of important sessions for you to keep in ma mind. Make sure that you attend the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Session with Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings in this afternoon in the ballroom from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Dr. Ladson Billings will be presented with the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement at 4.45 at the beginning of the invited plenary session featuring Dr. Norma Gonzalez's talk, Imagining Literacy Equity, Theorizing Flows of Communities community practices. Following Dr. Gonzalez's plenary address, join us in for the town hall meeting at 615 in the Costa del Sol Center um, Salon, Salons D&E. Okay, so the agenda for today's session includes the presentation of the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award. This will be followed by the introduction and presentation of the Oscar S. Causey Award, and then Dr. Susan Newman will deliver the Oscar S. Causey Address. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Taffy Raphael from the University of Illinois, Chicago, who will present the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award to this year's recipient. Taffy? Hello everyone. I'm pleased to have chaired the committee for selecting the third P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award. And I'd like to begin by recognizing the hardworking committee members. And if you're here, will you please stand? Patty Anders, Kathy Au, Venice Boyd, Wanda Brooks, Doug Fisher, and Leslie Morrow. And I'd like to thank those who created. Thank you. They did work very hard. And I'd like to thank those who created the nominations that we reviewed, who remain anonymous at this point. This award is designed to honor the author or authors of an article, chapter, or book written at least five years prior to the nomination. And the article must have demonstrably and positively influenced or impacted literacy practices or policies within district, school, or classroom settings. The nomination process starts with the author or someone who wishes to nominate the author or team of authors of a piece of writing forwarding a letter of nomination. The letter should outline the case with supporting evidence that is then all reviewed by the full committee. This year the committee faced a particularly challenging task with two clearly eligible articles rising to the top of the pool. After many rounds of discussion, voting, more discussion, more voting, and a series of ties, the committee could not choose one article over the other. Both have impacted how students of diverse reading abilities are understood, and both have changed the way we think about practice in supporting students who face challenges in learning to read. In 1977, 
Dick Allington drew on his experiences in the reading clinic at SUNY Albany, publishing in the Journal of Reading an article well known to all, titled, If They Don't Read Much, How They Ever Gonna Get Good. The nominators note that in 1977, struggling readers spent most of their school days in remedial reading classrooms, instructed with repetitive, skills-based programs that offer decontextualized opportunities for practice. Dick's article turned the nature of the problem on its head. He helped the nation rethink classroom practices in terms of time spent on reading, instruction, and learning as a replacement for unproductive and limited classroom experiences. The article began a conversation that continues to this day, and today it is actually a given in most educational circles that all students must participate in authentic reading experiences to improve their skills. In 2002, Marsha Riddle Bewley and Sheila Valencia pushed our thinking about struggling readers and the instructional interventions provided through their study titled Below the Bar, Profiles of Students Who Fail State Reading Test, published in Educational Evaluation and Policy Analysis. Their unique approach analyzed the profiles of readers who fell into the lowest quartile on a high stakes test. Their findings provided clear evidence of the very different profiles of weaknesses as well as strengths of students who struggle with reading acquisition. They demonstrated that for the majority of these students, decoding proficiency was a relative strength. Published at the start of the Reading First Era, the study was particularly important in beginning the shift away from interventions that used a limited and often inappropriate emphasis on decoding at the expense of other critical areas such as vocabulary and compre comprehension. By providing evidence for why limited interventions, just as limited instruction, fail to meet the needs of students, of children we are educating, the two researchers set the stage for significant changes in policies and practice for learners who require additional support through excellent instruction within and beyond the classroom. Please join me in honoring both Dick Allington and the Marsha Riddle Bewley Sheila Valencia Research Partners. Please join me on the stage. I'll just note that uh, Taffy's conclusion that the challenge was set uh, is still waiting for it to be met. <laughs> uh, we still have way too many struggling readers, struggling not because there's something wrong with them, but because of things that are wrong with us. Thank you. <laughs> Sheila and I are both so honored to be here and to have this work recognized and to know that the work has made an impact. I've been so fortunate to have Sheila as my mentor over the years. And this study was a reaction to questioning how mandated assessment data was being misused. So a few years back, I was a first year administrator in a school district finishing working with Sheila and um, in a large urban district. And Sheila had trained me well to um, to expect evidence for the instructional decisions that were being made. So when the state superintendent made a comment at a statewide administrators meeting that all level one and level two students on the state who, who scored a level one or level two on the state test just needed phonics, I politely and a bit naively raised my hand in that audience of 2,000 state administrators and asked why, why could she say that? What was the data? Was there something there? Um, and of course, if thinking that if she had the magic answer, we'd all be rich and we'd all be retired. And yet here we all are. <clears throat> so she didn't have that answer, but her question and Sheila and my shared concerns about how assessment data was being misinterpreted and impacting instruction negatively led to this work. I'll just add that after I received my degree, I went back to public schools for seven years and I worked with kids and with teachers trying to understand what influenced practice and policy. So for those seven years, I became really concerned and committed 
to trying to make the connection between policy and practice. And it was when I came to NRC seven years later, entering this venue late in life, that I found a home for, for this work and the home for people who are deeply concerned about policy practice connections. And I can't imagine getting a better award named after a better person than P. David and his influence on our field. So I'm so appreciative. Thanks. Thank you, Taffy, and congratulations to Dick Allington and Marshall Riddell Boley and Sheila Valencia. We'll now turn to the Oscar S. Causey Award. Dr. Lori Henry, chair of the Oscar Causey Award, will introduce the award criteria and the committee members. Then, as is the tradition with this award, the previous winner reveals the new awardee. Dr. Yetta Goodman, who was honored with this award in 2014, will reveal the 2016 awardee and then introduce Dr. Susan Newman, the 2015 Oscar S. Causey Award winner. First, Lori Henry. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here this morning as chair of the Oscar S. Causey Award Committee and um, be able to unveil the best kept secret at LRA every year. So it's a, a, a really um, fun award to be a part of. First, I wanna introduce our um, committee members. If our committee members are here in the audience, if you would please stand. Um, Catherine Kelly, Catherine Robertson, uh, Roberts, sorry, Aria, um, Luz, Bridget, and Mary. Thank you for your hard work. This is always a very difficult award when it comes down to the, the pool of nominees. Um, they're usually very, very close in the running, and uh, so it's, it's a difficult task for this award committee to actually select um, who the winner will be. The Oscar Causey Award is given for outstanding contributions to literacy research. There are five criteria that are assessed by the committee. Three of those criteria focus on publications. The individual has published both substantial and significant research in the area of literacy, as well as original research in the area of literacy. The research has generated new knowledge to the field, and the individual is also recognized as a leader in the conduct and promotion of literacy research. As we review here our past Oscar Causey Award winners, I'd like to invite um, Yetta to come to the stage. future researcher <laughs> to announce uh, the 2015, and people will have to work out the years because we're using different years for the same people, so it's okay, it'll work. To announce the 2015 Oscar Causey Award winner's history, I use her words to help us discover her identity. My beginnings were in read alouds in German, my first language by my opa, a German-speaking Russian refugee to Canada. Having a home language other than English has put an important foundation for my literacy interests. By first grade, I knew enough English to be introduced to reading by Dick and Jane. They showed up in a grades one to 12, four-room schoolhouse in the middle of the Canadian prairies. Dick and Jane intrigued me. They went to the store with their mother while I helped my mother by getting water from the well in the middle of the yard. Plus, they had no outhouse. I was fascinated. <laughs> but I did learn to read with Dick and Jane and was doing well in school until third grade. That's when we moved to Vancouver where schools had advanced technology, which hadn't reached the prairies 
a mimeograph machine that made multiple copies of worksheets. I could read well, but I was so dismal in that subject called phonics that I was placed into a special reading class. I worked hard to get out of that class because the teacher was really weird. <laughs> but the experience left me curious about this thing called phonics. As a 15-year-old, we moved to California where academics were not central to the school curriculum. I excelled at electives like typing. Being fast at keyboarding would contribute to my career later as a researcher. I began college in California with the intent of becoming an attorney, but quickly changed my mind when I became a teacher's aide as part of the first wave of Title I. My job was to help readers struggle through Sullivan readers. Memories of my own struggles with phonics were re reawakened and I became determined to change instruction for linguistically and culturally different students. With my BA and teaching credential from California, I went to the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana for an MA in elementary education. <laughs> there, there was no center for the study of reading yet, but Dolores Durkin was there and I wanted to take a course with her. Durkin took the presence of an MA student in her PhD seminar as a personal insult, reflected in her advice on my first paper, write better. <laughs> a short time later, Durkin would be castigating teachers for mentioning and interrogating, but not giving explicit guidance. Following receiving my master's, I returned to California to teach and apply my new knowledge about phonics and reading in a second grade classroom. Unfortunately, the district had adopted the Wisconsin design for reading, which consisted of an endless supply of tests and worksheets on the arcane aspects of word attack. This child's expression of exasperation and despair <laughs> mirrored my own. After several years of worksheets, I decided to get a doctor at Wisconsin with the aim of challenging the Wisconsin design. <laughs> when Wayne Otto responded less than enthusiastically to my application, I found a home in the Department of Ed Psych, where I had a glorious time learning about language development, sociolinguistics, and classroom research. I would spend my career in a seven-year cycle at three universities, which meant that I never got sabbaticals but was fortunate to have incredible colleagues. Mid-career, I returned to the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana to work on a special project. The Center for the Study of Reading may have been advocating that teachers provide students with strategic support, but the center director's advice of UG on my writing provided little concrete guidance. Many generous and patient co-authors have taught me to write better and through collaboration permitted me to find ways to support the learning of students who depend on public schools to become highly literate. Some of these colleagues are no longer with us but are not forgotten. Several colleagues have been especially important sources to my learning and development as a reading researcher, in particular Gina Cervetti, Charlie Fisher, and David Pearson. And then there have been the kids who have always reminded me of why my work matters. I want to just add a few words from the award winners, nominators. Oscar Causey was a pioneer, a leader, and a tireless worker. The same can be said about LRA's 2015 Oscar Causey Award winner. She's a pioneer who breaks new ground on a regular basis, allowing the field to develop new insights. She's a highly respected leader who has directed major literacy research initiatives and curriculum development. Her influence on many generations of literacy scholars is without question, and she is Dr. Elfrida H. Hebert.
as Yetta's presentation showed, I have many people to thank for having me behind this podium for this award. Many of the faces of those who have nurtured me and taught me to write better <laughs> appeared on the PowerPoint. But today I particularly want to acknowledge three individuals who I'm nominating to get at least a thousand Google citation credits, <laughs> which is a new thing I'm proposing uh, for writing my letter. And those people would be Gina Cervetti, Nell Duke, and David Pearson. All of them have had a deep and sustaining faith in me. First, there was the worry whether I'd ever get the Kazi, and now there's the worry of having to prepare a worthy speech. So I'm off now to begin obsessing about what I'm going to be saying here a year from now. Thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Keeping the custom of recent years, it's my responsibility to introduce the 2014 winner of the Oscar Causey Award. Dr. Susan Newman is Professor of Early Childhood and Literacy and Chair of the Teaching and Learning Department of the New York University. She received her doctorate at the University of uh, Pacific in Stockton and from 20 from 2000 to 2013 was Professor of Education at the University of Michigan serving as director of the Center for the Improvement of Early Reading Achievement and the Reading to Learn Research Center. Her career in literacy research has focused on ecological factors related to reading, including how providing access to books and other supports enable children and their families to be successful. She considers herself an interventionist, an applied scholar, working to influence the lives of children and to change the odds for children who live in poverty by providing resources to families demonstrating how they're able to support their children's literacy development. One of her recent books, Giving Our Children a Fighting Chance, with her co-author Donna Solano, provides research highlighting the inequity of resources between children from affluent communities and those from poverty. She documents how increased access to literacy resources for children of poverty closes that gap. As a result, she's focused instruction for children on the world of words, a program helping teachers to organize learning environments through shared experiences with books and media. Evidence from her research shows how pre-K, kinder, and first grade children benefit from such instruction. She served the United States as UA, as the United States Assistant Secretary of the Elementary and Secondary Education under President George W. Bush, establishing the Early Reading First and the Early Childhood Professional Development Program, as well as leading accountability efforts for improvement of children's achievement. When she left the Department of Education in 2003, Time Magazine reported that she was concerned about some department members who were trying to take a hard line on accountability and who saw NCLB as a way to expose the failure of public education, pushing hard for market forces and privatization. Dr. Newman's contributions have been widely featured in national and local news services, highlighting her energies to help educators and, pas and pa parents foster a learning spirit in all children. She works with teachers in classrooms throughout the United States and provides insights into how teachers can address the Common Core standards. She contributes actively in professional literacy organizations, especially as reviewer and editor of journals and with committee leadership par and participation. She was elected to the Reading Hall of Fame in 2012. She has grants from foundations that support her research and professional development and a prolific list of publications, including hundreds of articles, chapters, and books, focusing on improving the odds of children who live in disadvantaged communities. 
please help me welcome Dr. Susan Newman, 2014 Oscar Crosby Award winner. This is daunting. This is really <laughs> something. Um, thank you so much for the lovely um, introduction, Yetta, and um, a wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I actually, um, Freddie, it's not so scary. Um, but I'd like to start by saying there, uh, with all due respects to this wonderful program committee, there was a little bit of a typo in your program. Um, the program actually says, the title of my talk today is called Opportunities to Learn, Give Children a Fighting Chance. And it's not an exhortation. In other words, for the first time, I have actually left the colon out of my uh, title. It's not asking to give kids a fighting chance. What I hope to do over the period of, of uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, is to show you through a logical a set of studies that opportunities to learn do give children a fighting chance. So, an important change, but a little, uh, a little change, but an important change. So when I think about this time of year, you know, it's always hard for us to come to this conference in some ways. We've just come from Thanksgiving, we're about to hit Christmas and Kwanzaa and Hanukkah, and it's a bit of an exciting time and a wonderful time, but at the same time filled with activity. But for me, my favorite time of year is not the Christmas, Kwanzaa, or the Hanukkah, but it is Passover. Passover is a time, I am a secular Jew, um, some people would say even less than that, but one of the things that has always meant a great deal to me is an understanding of my history. And in Passover, this wonderful holiday that we have every single year, we come together as a family, at a set of friends, and we review our history and the wonderful celebration of our struggles and our resilience. And when I think about that, in the middle of this very long, if you ever get invited, be careful, at this very long <laughs> um, ceremony that we have, there's a crescendo that happens. And what we say is dayenu. We say it in great joy. And that word dayenu actually means a great deal. It is to celebrate what we have gone through, but at the same time, it has a bit of irony. What it says is we've gone through and we're appreciative and that we care about where we ha are. But at the same time, it urges us to push on. It urges us to say what we think is so important and what we need to see next. And with the notion of Dianu, what I want to do is I want to talk today about my own personal history, but also our collective history as a community of scholars who care deeply about children. I wanted to start by giving you just a, <laughs> I don't know if you know who this is, but I wanted to start by just telling you a little bit about my history because many of you might be experiencing that right now. Um, I started, I went to a small uh, graduate school and I finished that uh, graduate school and I am blessed to have a wonderful academic as a husband and I knew the gig, I knew what had to happen. And that gig means that I knew that I had to uh, publish a great deal of articles, that the way of getting on the charts was to get those articles out and get them out quickly, right? So the first year after my doctorate, you know, there's always a little bit uh, of delay, but then after that first year, um, I started writing articles. I wrote six articles in one year. 
six articles. And I sent them out with great hope. And then six months later, because you know what happened years ago, it took a long time, much better than Linda, <laughs> much worse than Linda and I do now. Six months later, what came back were six letters of rejection. Now, David Pearson is here today, and I want to say that his letter was very nice. <laughs> it was. It was nice, just like you would expect. But it was a reject nonetheless. And in fact, what I got was two rejects in one day. And I remember going to the post office. I had my baby in hand. It was my second child. I looked at those letters, and you know, they could be mean. They could be really mean. And what I did is I handed my baby to my husband. I went into my room, and I did what every good scholar does at that stage in their career. <laughs> I cried. <laughs> and what I did then is, you know what happens. I stayed for a bit. And then I got out, and I got those articles published in a year. True, some of them were vanity journals. Some of them, I don't know where they are now in, in you know, virtual or whatever, but I got those out. And that opportunity, I was now on the charts. You know that phenomena. And what it allowed me to do is something that I wanted to do very much, and I can't move my... doesn't move, guys. So much for technology. So what being on the charts actually meant is I was now able to get the job I always wanted. And that job was in Philadelphia, is at Temple University. I don't know if I have any Temple University faculty here, but for me, it was the dream job. It was what I wanted to do. And I don't know if any of you have ever had passion about a particular place, but for me, it was encapsulated in my Philadelphia. It is a gorgeous city with beautiful boulevards and beautiful and dramatic history. But it's also a, a, a city of industry and hard work. There's something, there's a, a southern um, sense of it due to migration, I guess, and whatever. And I always said in Philadelphia, what they would do is they would knife you in the front rather than the back. <laughs> but you know, Hey, it was what it was. But there, the other side of Philadelphia, and that other side, let's see, is um, a beautiful little part of Philadelphia. Some of you might know it is Chestnut Hill. And it is a, an area in the city of Philadelphia. But if you notice, it's very beautiful. It's like a little suburb. It has, you can walk to your little studio of yoga. Uh, you don't need to take your car. And in every area, what you'll see is beautiful little flowers that just dot the environment. But as Mayor de Blasio would say, there's another Philadelphia. And that other Philadelphia is where I lived. Um, for those of you who, who know a little bit about my history, my husband was a professor at MIT at the time, and so I would commute to Philadelphia. And what I did one time is I, uh, this is the Philadelphia Badlands. It is known because of a shoot 'em up kind of ideology in this particular area. It's, um, and so what I did is I asked, what would it be like to walk to school in Philadelphia close to where I live and work? And so walking to the neighborhood school, I walked with a parent, a set of parents, and I said, take me to the closest school that you would go to. And this is our walk in Philadelphia. This is what we would see, the signs, the, the uh, environment. 
These are the playgrounds that children had to play in and the places where parents would sit and relax. This is the blight that they would see every single day on the way. You would actually have to step over all the blight in order to get to uh, school. And then these are the signs in this poor community and there are no signs. So if you don't know where you're going, you're stuck because there the signs have all been torn down. And what I began to ask is I said, what does this do to the child? What does this do when e the child walks to that school every single day? What does that do to their sense of hope, to their aspirations? to their belief about whether they can get out of this environment. And that is when I stop looking at the charts. And that's when I stop thinking about Billy Joel. And I began to realize that good research is about doing good and about changing the odds for so many of our children who have to deal with this day by day. What I began to realize, and I took much more centrally, is Brenner's notion of this environment or ecological theory. What I recognize is that when a child comes to school, they're not just coming as an individual, they're coming as a community. They're coming two generations at a time. So our notion of just sitting down and helping that child to read ignores all those factors that affect that child, their belief about themselves, their sense of efficacy. So I began to take that much more seriously. And I recognized that we have to look at the, the environment. And one of the things I say, you know, you get this wonderful opportunity with it, Oscar Kazi. I urge our group to focus on this environment and not just always focus on the individual. So I began to become an ecological documentarian. I don't know if you ever heard this before, but basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to show policymakers what this looked like. I wanted to show them what the tale of two cities actually would do. And so what we did is with a, urban, a set of urban uh, ethnographers, we went to Chestnut Hill and we walked every single block and we walked and documented every single place. And what we asked is, where could I get a book for children? Where could I possibly buy a book in this middle class environment? And of course, what you see there is there are 1,200 children in this neighborhood, and we found 11 places you could buy a book, and there was always also 16,000 titles that you could find. In other words, there was so much choice a parent could conceivably read to the child every single day and still have more to read. But then you look at the Philadelphia Badlands, a concentrated poverty community, and what do you see? You see barriers, and they're often train tracks. They're often different kinds of ways of cordoning off a community from all the others in a community. But what we would see is about 10,000 children, just four places you could find books, and 33 books in total for those children. What we found was those 33 books were coloring books with very, very little print. And so we began to say, how can we begin to get this out? And my second underlying message today is we went to Philadelphia Inquirer. And I remember giving a talk here at LRA, then NRC, and I said, this is the, what we're seeing, a tale of two cities in our city, our beloved city. And a person put this, one of the reporters put this on the front page of Philadelphia Inquirer. We wanted to make people cry. So you think about what, we've, what we're seeing now, and you and I know what we're seeing, but we're not doing much about it. And that is we're seeing more segregation in our cities across the country than ever before. We now have the uber rich, right? And I say here, not so invisible 
uh, gated communities because you and I don't go there. They exist, but we can't even go there. There's a shrinking middle class. And what we have as a result of some good work is concentrated poverty has decreased. So it's gone from 60 to 40%. That's the good news. But the bad news is that there are more poverty communities in the United States than ever before. Places that have not ever come back from the Great Recession or whatever we're calling it. So we asked a question that Dick Allington asked uh, years ago, and along with um, Anne McGill Franson, and we said, all right, what would happen to children in the summer? All right, schools are closed. Um, what happens to those kids who are in these kinds of concentrated or borderline poverty communities? And this time, last summer, what we did is we went to three communities. Again, we want to show policymakers what we're doing. So we went to Anacostia, D.C., which if you're ever there, is just over. We wanted to go to Obama's backyard. And we wanted to see what was happening in terms of where we could get books for children in Obama's backyard. And you'll notice that while we have less poverty in some of our communities, we have more poverty in children. Um, for our children. So in this community, there's 61% children who live in poverty. We then went to Hamtramck um, on the right-hand side, and that has 67% of the children who live in poverty. And finally, we went to Vermont Square, LA, to look and see again uh, about uh, the access to books and materials. So what we did is this time we could actually uh, either drive or bike or walk, and we walked every single community during this summer, uh, this past summer. And what you might expect is in Washington, D.C., 830 children would have to share one book. Now, we have all this money that we're spending on wars and whatever, and we cannot provide a book to our children. So that 830 children have to share one book. And you know what? It's a dictionary. It's a dictionary. Fun read. We went to um, Hamtramck again. We did the same exact thing. We went to Hamtramck and we found a, at least three books. And in Hamtramck, those books were in Polish um, and they were locked in a, a library. So my point is, we began to focus on this even more, and we're calling it book deserts. What we're seeing across America are book deserts. These are places that don't have books for our children. And again, what we did is we went to People Magazine, we went to Washington Post, and we spread the word. Because one of the things we know is that when we talk about families, and you and I know this, we often talk about their disinclination to read or they don't like to read. But we've never asked, do they have the capabilities? Do they have the resources in order to do this activity? And so from our perspective, by highlighting book deserts, what we're saying is this. There has been too little attention to the structural inequalities that play a central role in children's achievement. And there's too much emphasis on the issue of individuality. What can children read if there are no books? So one of the things that I want to turn to is the notion of opportunity to learn. Now, many of you remember this topic and this focus, opportunities to learn. Remember, we were trying a while ago to have opportunity to learn standards, and that failed miserably because the Republicans just batted that down real quickly. But guess what? Opportunity to learn is back in. And one of the things that I want to move to is we can't just be ecological documentarians. We cannot just say, what are the problems? What you and I need to begin to do is let's talk about the solutions. 
Let's talk about what we can do to change the odds for these children who live in poverty. And so we go to the opportunity to learn uh, uh, <laughs> definition. And when I looked at this definition, I said, this is not brain science, right? But the concept of opportunity to learn is based on John Carroll, remember him long ago, and it rests on a very logical proposition, which is students learn what we teach. <laughs> I mean, hey, students, if they're exposed to it, they can learn what we, uh, what we teach, both in and out of school. And so if you have a chance, read Bill Schmidt's article on opportunity to learn in the recent uh, educational researcher. It's just wonderful. But it also says that we can mitigate some of the uh, noxious effects of poverty. But I took our opportunity to learn, and what I want to do in the remaining uh, parts of my address is to talk about three premises or th three things that I think are central as a result of opportunity to learn and whether or not children can achieve. The first premise, if we expect children to be able to read, then they should have something to read. Again, very simple, right? Premise two, if we expect parents to engage in behaviors associated with li early literacy, then we've got to provide them with a resource in which to do so. So if you're living in a high poverty community and there is very little, we cannot say read 15 minutes every day or do a, a, a work on your Googling every day if you don't have it. And then premise three, if we expect children to learn higher order thinking and conceptualize big ideas, then we, can, we have got to provide them with more ambitious teaching. So now what I want to do is I want to move to trying to argue for why I say this. And I want to do it as a set of, have you ever heard the term proof of concept, proof of principle? Basically what it argues is that I'm seeing my studies as an example of a proof of concept or a central proof of principle. So let's get started. My first premise, premise one, access to books and resources will provide opportunities to learn. So uh, you saw these quick things come up uh, because I'm not as good as Janice on my PowerPoints. But the bottom line is I want you to look at this. This is your government at work. Remember there are 10,000 children in uh, Anacostia and this is our effort in healthy foods. Uh, this is a healthy corner and you'll see that there are five potatoes and three onions and four um, apples. That's your government at work. So we did an interesting experiment and we said, and remember I come from New York, Bloomberg's um, uh <laughs> world, um, what if we took all that awful juice and what, uh, you know, that horrible uh, sticky kind of drink and Coke and whatever, and what if we change these vending machines to actually be book repositories? What if instead of handing out books to parents, what if we gave them a sense of agency and choice and actually give them an opportunity to find books? And then finally, what if we attempted to reach them where they are rather than have them come to where we are? And so this is our first study of this. With a, uh, the effort of uh, JetBlue, and we took all those awful drinks off, we took all those Cheetos out, and we put in books. And what we saw is we then went to where people congregate. Remember last year I was there doing um, block by block and we found that people spent a great deal of time at church and they were at Matthew's Memorial Church and inside that church is an early childhood center. And then they were also at the Salvation Army because in some of our poor communities there's a whole wellness component and all the HR is bounded in uh, Salvation Army. And then we found the shop right. And what we did is we put a vending machine in each of those settings. 
And what we began to do is, as you know, I am always taking pictures. I am a documentarian. And what we began to do is we began to see how families came to our vending machines a little bit scared at the beginning, but growing in confidence later on. And what they would do is they would look at books and they would actually spend time looking at them. Let me just tell you a little bit of our research design. I don't want to spend too much on research because I, I'm focusing on proof of concept. But basically what we did is here were our treatment sites, as I mentioned, and we had counterfactual sites, the 7-Eleven, the CVS, the Metro Station. And we have a, a robust sample of over 400 people. And what we did is after people went to the vending machine or around the vending machine or if they were at the metro station or the 7-Eleven, we did a survey. And some of these measures I'm sure you're familiar with. That we did demographics, reading habits, we did current events, and we did title recognition test and an author recognition test with a slight variation from Q. Stavich's wonderful work. What we did is we put more African-American titles because this is primarily African-American community and we put vending machine titles so that we could see if there was uh, a variation um, in their uh, recognition and print exposure. And this is to me something remarkable. In eight weeks, 27,000 books were, were taken. 27,000 books were taken from this environment. And what you find, if what you could look at, is that they were distributed in zero to three age, uh, four to six, five, and even the tween. In other words, people wanted these books. By the time we had to take the vending machines away, they were in pristine condition. There was never any vandalism, even though some of the people were worried that that would be the case. But what was also remarkable is we began to see that there was greater print exposure in our community, that people recognized more titles, that they had um, less foils, and they recognized both famous uh, titles as well. But even more important, and I know you're going to say no causal analysis because there's no pre and post, right? But at the same time, again, I want to tell you that this is the story. These are people who are waiting to get books. So my point in saying this is when there's a supply, there will be a demand. And what we did next and what we're doing in the coming year, by the way, if anybody lives in Detroit, we're on to Detroit this coming year. But what we're saying to proprietors is you don't have books because you don't think they'll buy them. Guess what? If you had books, there will be a demand. When resources are available, parents take advantage of it. That's the answer to my first. My second premise is resources for parents. I want you to look at this picture, and I want you to tell me who's the principal and who's the parent. <laughs> and tell me, do they like each other? <laughs> right. So my second premise is this. When we treat parents with dignity and respect and focus on what they do well rather than their deficiencies, we will give them and their families an opportunity to learn. And I want to show you, this is just a beautiful picture from our, our work um, with uh, parents. But I wanted to just show what we tried to do and in this second study. And again, this is sort of a summary of some of this work and I'll say it quickly. And by the way, for those of you LRA has become more, uh, almost a secondary group. We're, you're going to have to deal with Head Start, all right? Just be aware that I focus on early childhood. But my understanding of ecological theory says that you can't just focus on resources. And very often, that's what we've done wrong. Again, what you said, Dick Allington, years ago, 
is resources are important, but they're not sufficient. And what we recognize is that in our theory of physical and psychological support, that people tend to do what is close to them, but they also tend to do things that are supported by the people around them. So what we did was a very interesting experiment that we said it's not just about the resources, but it's about the people who support them. This is with my uh, dear colleague, uh, Kathy Roskos. And what we did is we designed a play setting. Now you have to get again into my world in Head Start. We designed a play setting that had environmental print. And this is a little office setting uh, that we created out of a typical housekeeping quarter. And you'll notice various signs and books and all the kinds of things like little memo pads and uh, telephones and, uh, you know, uh, uh, callbacks and all sorts of things in this little play center. And we had a very interesting research design here. What we were trying to do is um, Head Start parents are required to actually uh, contribute and volunteer in Head Start. But what we tried to do here is we said to the Head Start parents, you in group one, you are parent teachers. You are parent teachers. And in, even in that word, what that said is that these people were important. And we want you to hang out at this session, at, in this little play area. And we want you to just participate and engage with children in any way that you see fit. Now, one of the things I want you to note about this intervention is that we did not train parents. Parents are not animals. Parents are parents who have a great deal of knowledge and cultural tradition behind what they are. And so what we said is just hang out and hang out with the kids and respond to them. And then in the second group, what we said is uh, uh, parent teachers come to our setting and just observe, which is what parents often are encouraged to do. Just observe, don't do anything with the kids, just observe. And then in the third group, what we said is, come if you want to, don't come if you don't. So this was more or less business as usual. And what we were interested in finding is whether children actually could understand environmental print, some of the work that Yetta Goodman has done long time ago and recognized, and whether they understood functional print, how print actually works. And what we did is some of those tasks were related to like Leah McGee and um, uh, did many years ago. And what we found in the, the um, and I won't read it to you all the way, but what we found in um, the play setting where the parents were just observing, where two boys are playing with a stamp pad and stampers, and they're playing and, they, uh, and Kyle says, I did it all. He put all sorts of marks on it. Um, and Duran says, you did good, and now you're going to get a lot of money from me. And Kyle says, hold it, the calculator. And Duran says, looky here, stamps. And Kyle says, I told you. And then what Kyle does is he says, B, B, C, L, D, L, X, C, L, S, D, Z, Z, which is the stamper pad that uh, was on. And none of those letters have anything to do with reality, right? I mean, they're not on the stamper pad at all. But the other child is always supportive and said, hey, you did good work. Now, if you were analyzing this as a play person, you would say, this is exciting because the children are actually handling functional print, right? And actually engaged in many of the literacy practices. And true, we were engaged. Here's Leslie and Daryl and Dolores in the office. Leslie is cleaning um, and Daryl is stamping and, um, and there's a three ring binder and Leslie says, cops, come and get Daryl and Dolores, bye, on the phone. Cops coming to get you, Dolores. Daryl said, uh-uh. Leslie is, Daryl, uh-uh, still stamping. Leslie says, yes, yes, is. Dolores is still pretend writing. They're going to get me. They're going to come and get you because you's being bad. And Leslie says, I'm calling the cops on you again. No, you ain't. 
<laughs> Leslie says, yes, I is. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, nine, nine. So you see some of the wonderful activity that is going on in the course of just this wonderful play, right? But then when we look at what the parents, remember the parents are hanging out at this um, play setting and they're just engaged based on whatever the children want to do. And we see David and four other children in the office with Miss Wanda and David is holding the phone and Miss Wanda says, David, what you doing on the phone? Mm, I dialed off. You talking on the phone? Yeah. A lot of people do that in the office. Keep lifting up that phone. Yeah. Making business arrangements. Yeah. My mommy do. My mommy do too. Your mommy do? Now, I want you to take a look at this. It's, it's African-American vernacular, you'll see. But one of the things you'll also see is there's some contingent talk here that the, parents is, is, the parent is both talking to and listening to the children. It isn't in the way you might negotiate or talk with your children, but this is what we call high quality talk. This is contingent talk. This is what we want parents to do and engage in. Here's another example. Miss Wanda uh, is in with two children. Joanna, they, they stamps. You put them on envelopes. You have an envelope. I got it down there, leaves the envelope alone. Good, you did it nice. But next time, how about putting it in the front <laughs> of the envelope, okay? <laughs> Not on the back, okay? This is the back. That's the front. Oh, here's the front. Oh, here, I'm going to show you how to do it. You lick it a little bit, you put it on the front, and then you stamp it on the envelope. There. And the child finishes the task. Now, you and I might call that a little bit directive, right? It's very explicit talk. It is good talk. And the children are learning. And this is something we often criticize. It's too directive. But this is a beautiful opportunity of watching a parent naturally engage with children, doing what she can to promote children's literacy. And what did we see? We saw that those children who had that parent those children who were engaged in this kind of environmental print, they knew environmental print better, they understood the functions of, of print, and they used print better. So many times, my point here is saying that it's not about training parents. It's about giving them opportunity and giving them um, an opportunity to actually give, uh, let us know what they are so capable of doing. And now on to my third premise. What if we gave children ambitious curriculum? What if instead of the kind of curriculum that's a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of nothing, we actually try to teach children in ways that we would only would like ourselves? What if we do a kind of literacy that engages children in helping them learn about their world and helping them master their, their world. One of the things that I think very often, frankly, is that schools often contribute to inequality by giving them a curriculum that is basic skills, primitive, and that doesn't engage them in any way. So many of you will recognize that this is our uh, a curriculum effort that we decided to do that would embrace both content instruction, vocabulary so that children would actually have the words, but also focus on the conceptual and the big ideas. And what we decided to do is focus on things that children are really interested in, that instead of boring them to death, we would engage them in learning about wild animals and being responsible and learning about ecology and energies, the mysteries of space and sounds and ocean zones. And these are children who are presumably coming from very high poverty communities. But we said that we're not just going to do good instruction, we're going to accelerate that instruction. And our instruction has been called WOW. And what we, the reason we call it WOW is we want the children to say, 
we're getting this great curriculum. Wow. And that's what they would do. Here, we're talking about caves and exploring caves. But I wanted to just show you that we're doing it in a way that we hope is developmentally appropriate, or at least has shown uh, to be developmentally appropriate. We focus on text sets, a collection of different genres to help teachers um, and students support vocabulary teaching. We focus on a collection of books so that they understand a concept and develop those big ideas by having these concepts in multiple venues. We do a progression in our text set that focuses on developing through predictable text, mnemonic devices so that children are hearing these words, saying these words in a call and response and a chiming strategy. We focus on rhyming and narrative nonfiction. And by the time we get to information books, they have the rich vocabulary and the concepts that allow them to be successful. We have changed what we've done, and some of you have seen this quite some time, but we, we, we don't do thematic teaching. Thematic teaching is often based on the notion that here we have a grocery store, we have a cart, and we have a cash register, and we have some food, and that is based on our understanding of what often goes in, in these settings. So instead of a grocery store, if I could put in a bank, I could ask a child, what are things associated with a bank? And I would know it's an ATM, uh, you know, someone who helps me uh, cash checks and whatever, but the child would not know. So very often our themes are not based on any inherent properties of our themes. They're based on prior knowledge that many of our children may not know. So we began to focus on a different strategy for doing this. And we said that our topics need to have a structure that provide for inductive potential. And let me show you what that is. This inductive pot potential starts like this. Living things, for example, need food and air. What do living things need, boys and girls? Food and air, right? So if I say an insect is a living thing, what do you now know about an insect? It needs food and air. If I say a reptile is a living thing, what do you now know? It needs food and air. So in other words, what I have done is I've structured knowledge for children in ways that have an inductive potential. They are creating inductions as they go. Now what I'll say is an insect is six legs and three body parts, and I'll say a mosquito is an insect. What do you now know about a mosquito? It has, you got to take our curriculum. Uh, it has six legs and three body parts, and it's a living thing. So you know that a mosquito needs food and air in order to breathe. So what we began to do is we began to say that knowledge can be structured, and the structure can provide an inference ability, a, an ability for children to inference and to become self-learners on their own. And so we did an audacious experiment, and this is one of our experiments where we actually had the chutzpah to do this, and we said, what we're going to do is, you know how we normally do treatment and control studies, right? And we look and we say, bravo! And I often say, if we had so many wonderful results as we, you know, apparently do, then we'd be done, you know? We wouldn't need this conference. But what often happens is these children now go on to a, a middle class setting or an upper middle class with upper middle class kids. So in this audacious experiment, we said, we're going to compare our Head Start children who come from Detroit, by the way, um, treatment and control. And then we're going to add two other control groups. We're going to add a low middle class control group. And then we're going to select children who come from our professional settings. So in other words, we're going to say, are our kids so good in terms of the quality of instruction we're providing that they are as good as all these other children given over time? And what we found, as you can expect, is that word knowledge is a tough thing to improve over time. We improved it. But at the same time, what we noticed is those two groups were still way ahead, right? 
And what we then did is we looked at um, uh, whether children who were of uh, second language were doing well. And I want to just bring attention to the fact that the control group children in terms of conceptual development, second language learners, actually went down over the year. But what was most exciting about what we began to do, and thanks to uh, Julie Dwyer for making this wonderful graph, <laughs> Um, is we began to understand how children were actually learning in this curriculum. We said, how do children who have learned words and content in these taxonomic categories that we're creating, how do they talk about these inferences? And we said to the child, is a neck part of your body? Now remember, these are three-year-old, three and four-year-old children. And what we, the treatment group said, yeah, it's part of your body because you can't pull it off and it's attached. Attached means it can't come off. So then we asked, is glasses part of your body? Yeah, no, glasses are not part of your body because they can come off of you. In another situation, we said to the children, is hair part of your body? And some children said, yes, hair is part of my body because it's attached. Another child said, hair is not part of my body because my daddy doesn't have any. <laughs> but notice the quality of the justification. These are three and four-year-old children. They're thinking on their own. And what we found when we looked at conceptual development was is going to be the cover of my next book. Because what we found is over time that our little treatment children not only exceeded the lower middle class children, but were actually statistically on par with the upper middle class children. That what we were seeing is tremendous growth. When we provide them with the opportunity to learn, they learn. So what were our principles? The notion of acceleration, the notion of content rich, the notion of or an organization of word knowledge, the use of text sets, lots of practice in distributed review, and challenge. I refuse to accept that they're not capable of doing. So in conclusion, I, what we are seeing is if you look at my proof of concept and proof of principle, answer to premise number one, if we build them, they will come. If we provide resources, these parents that we talk about too often in very negative terms will use the materials that are provided. Answer to pre premise number two, parents are far more capable than we give them credit for. And we just have to give them opportunities for us to learn from them rather than from us to tell them what to learn. Three. Challenging curriculum can reduce educational inequity, and too often we have contributed to educational inequity by a dumbed-down curriculum. Opportunity to learn means honoring children's heritage. I hope you have noticed that in this short period of our conference, we have all talked about our heritage, because that is who we are, and we need to acknowledge that their community, and their families. We need to enable them when, when they don't have and give them access to, refu uh, to resources. And we need to refuse to perpetuate educational inequality by giving them a dumbed-down curriculum of basic skills, but giving them ambitious curriculum with ambitious teaching. I want to end with talking about ESEA. Because ESEA is about to be reauthorized. It passed the House, it's going to the Senate, and it will be approved by President Obama. There are some things in this um, ESEA, you all know, No Child Left Behind um, will be out. Every Student Succeed Act is about to be signed. And what you'll notice is there's testing three through eight, again, in high school. But the other thing that is very interesting and important for all of us is that there is an opportunity to learn clause in the new legislative regulations. This is our time. 
States will have wide latitude to do good or do ill. I beg you to pay attention. And I beg you to think about opportunity to learn, which will sometimes focus on teacher quality in ways that bash teachers and evaluate teachers in a way that none of us would agree to. <coughs> Opportunity to learn gives us our chance to give children a fighting chance. And so to my colleagues, I want to just highlight there's um, P is at the 0.001 level <laughs> of one person on this thank you list. But these are my wonderful colleagues. And I want to thank you for this great honor. This is a wonderful time. I'm so grateful to the opportunities, to the students, to all the people who I've worked with over the time. And in the spirit of this session, and my deep gratitude to all of you, Diane. I say this in the August of my career, the end of my, not really the end of the, uh, my career, I'm still going strong. But I say that it's now your turn, and I want you to do good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for that challenging talk. Maybe some of the themes that were brought in, um, into the talk can find their way back into town hall this evening. As a reminder, that will be after the plenary session. Please don't forget to attend Dr. Latson Billings' presentation from 3 to 4.30 and Dr. Norma Gonzalez's address from 4.45 to 6 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>